back with another edition of the Royce Boys Podcast. Josh and Anthony here with, with you guys as always. We have a fun episode. We're going to go ahead and dive right in. So yesterday's 88-85 to 85 overtime win over the uh, visiting Miami Hurricanes. Of course, the game went to overtime. Um, and Carolina was able to pull out the much-needed home win to improve to 9-1 and one in the ACC for the first time under Roy Williams. The best start under him since he came back to Chapel Hill to, to lead the program. And, buddy, it was kind of the game that we, we both predicted in the preview. And I think a lot of people around the, 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 the program thought it was going to be just a game that Carolina was probably going to win. But it felt like a game that they wouldn't play their best just because of how good they were the other night. A noon game, and those, you know, we've we've seemed to struggle with those recently, whether we're at home or on the road. But ultimately, they did enough to get the job done and, and stay in the race with Duke and Virginia for first place and the ACC. Yeah, I mean, you pretty much hit the nail on the head. I mean, the start time, uh, really the team that we were playing as well in Miami is always a team that really gives us a tough time no matter where we're at. I mean, remember last year, of course, they beat us at the buzzer. They showed the shot three times on the broadcast, so how could you forget? But, you know, it was you know kind of what we broke down in the – pregame preview for that which was you know this is going to be a team in Miami that is going to fight because they're coached by a guy in Jim Laranega who pretty much learned that he had to do that when he was at George Mason because his teams just really weren't all that talented when it came to facing some of the stiffer competition that he faced in his run to the final four back in 07 so you know I, I think that it showed once again that there's no easy days in the ACC. And Miami, look, for everybody that wants to say, well, you know, that Miami team is terrible. Look at the record. Look, there's a lot of talent there. They've had some injury issues. There really is, you know, a little bit of depth concern there as well. But part of that is also because they got a lot of young guys. So, you know, I, I think it, it was a good win. I think that, you know, one of the main things that I really liked about the win from a Carolina perspective was, you know, this was a game that in past years, you just kind of feel like this team would have, held, you know, held themselves around, but in the end, they wouldn't have been able to pull out because, you know, they just... I, I don't know. They just never really were that team that could get over the top. They would always have a game like this where they would seem to lose and you would say, OK, well, you know, we kind of expected that similar to last year when we played them. But in this game, there was just something different. It, despite the fact that Miami was about as hot as you could pretty much be from three point land in the second half. And, you know, we can discuss that a little bit more as we continue to recap this game. You know, was that because of the lack of defense, which I, you know, I didn't really think it was all that bad, or was that really because of, you know, Miami just being hot from deep? I think it was a little bit of both, but, you know, they they were on fire, and Carolina just continued to match them bucket for bucket after, you know, most of the early part of the game was really streak for streak. So one team would go on a 7 nothing run, the other team would counter with a 9 nothing run. Then you'd have a 13-3 to run from Miami. And then it would be a 7-2 to two run from Carolina. And, you know, it was just back and forth. It was all over the place. And for a while there... You know, Miami did have the lead alone for them, you know, for themselves. And Carolina, you know, stuck around. And, and you got to give them credit for that to keep themselves around in the game to give themselves a chance to send the game to overtime late. But, you know, I, I think that in the overtime, Carolina really took over and showed that, look, they were the more aggressive team. They were the better team when it came to the overtime period. And that was, you know, seen in the final possession where, you know, you go for the turnover. I thought Kobe White did a great job almost getting it out the first attempt. He ends up picking up the foul. And then on the second attempt, they go for it and create the loose ball. Brandon Robinson gets the run out and ultimately – winds the time off the clock. So, 
you know, I, I thought overall it was a hard fought effort from, you know, a team that was faced with adversity, which is something that you're going to be faced with throughout the tournament and really throughout the rest of conference play too, because, you know, this is the ACC and in the NCAA tournament, yeah, you're going to face teams that really on paper are not better than you, but maybe they're having a better game than you. So it's just about how you respond in those situations. And I thought Carolina responded exactly the way they needed to in the game yesterday against Miami. Yeah, really just a, a, a gritty performance. You know, Roy Williams said in his post game, he questioned their toughness all night long through, through every media timeout during the halftime. And then of course going into the overtime session and yesterday was a tough win because they got out-rebounded, which no one saw coming. Uh, Miami is the worst rebounding team in the conference. Carolina is the best. And Miami owned Carolina on the glass, 39-32. Um, you know, you mentioned it, and the, defensively, they, they were playing good defense. Miami was making shots. They combined, the teams combined for 19 May threes in the second half. Carolina was 9 of 12 from three in the second half. So they were just as hot as Miami was and Kobe in the second or in the second half was was he five for five from three in the second half, I think is what his stat line was. So just really a, a unconscious effort from him from three point land. But you know, you're gonna have to win a game like that even on your home floor where you don't you don't play well. And you know, they did they, they of course won that opportunity against Louisville way back in January. But they were able to get it done yesterday. Um, Miami's just a team that they – Jim Laranega is like Rick Barnes. He knows how to play against Roy Williams' teams. Don't know what it is or, you know, what it is about them. But they could have three players, and they'd probably give Carolina all they can handle because he just knows how to coach against Roy Williams, Really, just, which is a testament to him as a coach. But, you know – just really, you know, a, a, a proud effort. You know, uh, Luke May had another monster game after the, the, the domination against NC State the night before, which was really good because we didn't have a whole lot of balance again. Only four guys in double figures. You got to think Kobe had 33 and Luke had 20. So that was 53 of our 88. That's well over 50% of our scoring. So the balance wasn't there like we wanted it and needed to be. But, you know, when, when you get a win, it's hard to complain. Um, is there anything else you know you want to add? Because I know you got to watch the game. I was listening to it while I was working, so you have a much clearer take of what happened as opposed to what I have. I mean, really, you know, when I looked at the game, I thought, you know, the tempo was easily in favor of Miami. We didn't control the tempo at all in the game, and so... You know, I, I thought it was interesting that Carolina was able to adjust to Miami's tempo in the second half and really play Miami's game. Um, you know, it, it's something that you're really just not used to seeing with Carolina. I mean, of course, there were moments that they sped it up, but I think Miami was the team that really dictated it because Miami is a team that also, so far this season at least, has shown that they have their moments where they like to speed the basketball up. But, you know, when I looked at it also, I, you know, there were two guys that in the starting lineup that didn't score in double figures, and that was Garrison Brooks and Kenny Williams, but both of them hit key shots in the overtime period. So that's the big thing. When you look at these guys, yeah, they, they might not always be the most efficient players, and for time, you know, at times, you know, they do go a little quiet, but when you need them to step up, they hit the big shots, and it feels like that's kind of the rhythm that this entire team is in right now, and we saw it from Kobe White. You were thinking, okay, when you're watching the game or even if you're listening to the game like you were, you you had to be thinking at least a little bit in your head. Okay, eventually he's going to miss one, right? It's just when is he going to miss one, and then can we counter that with a stop? And you were praying that, okay, he's not going to miss one, you know, on the last possession if he's the guy that takes the shot. Now, he didn't end up taking the last shot, but 
You know, he knocked down everything that he needed to, and then Luke May ends up knocking down the shot that he needed to. The only guy that missed a shot that would have tied the game at 77 uh, would have been uh, Cam Johnson. He ended up missing a three-point shot that would have tied the game there. But, you know, really just not a great day for Cam overall. Three of 11 from the field, just two of seven from three. Um, you know, but still, I mean, finishes with 12 points and four rebounds as well. So it was still a key part of what was going on. But, you know, this team right now, it just seems like they are playing with a rhythm that was lacking earlier in the year. They realize that the inside game is is where they need to go. They, they have to be more aggressive attacking the basket. And if it opens up those three-point shots – then, you know, let it open that up and take those chances when you get them as opposed to forcing those chances early on in games when they're not there. And so, you know, the other thing with with Kobe White at this point, I I don't know what more you can say about this young man because right now uh, this might be the best player in college basketball outside of Zion Williamson because this kid is simply tearing it up. Uh, I mean, there's not a point guard that's playing better right now in the country. I don't care what anybody says. And you can say, you know, some of the guys, Chris Clemens over at Campbell, he's playing in, in a conference that, I mean, you're playing the the lady of the blind. I mean, there's no one in that conference that's worth anything. So, you know, I, I mean, I, I at this point, you know, Kobe White is just so dominant, and we've just never seen this from a Carolina point guard. Not that I remember. I don't know if maybe Phil Ford was at this level. I'd like to hear from some of the older Tar Heel fans as to whether or not he was. But from a pure point guard standpoint, we have not seen a guy like Kobe White at Carolina, at least in the Roy Williams era. And from, you know, my memory, I don't think ever at Carolina. Well, I guess that's going to conclude our discussion topic of Kobe White and where he stands as talented point guards to play for Roy Williams, which we'll go ahead and, and discuss that. I've thought about this ever since you sent it to me. Was it via text message? I think it was yesterday, concluding yesterday's win. And I, I don't know where I would stack him up against Felton, Lawson, uh, Marshall, Page and Barry. As a hey, just a hey, story. Bobby Frazier started every game his freshman year. Okay, we have to put give some respect to Bobby. At least give him an honorable mention here. Okay. As a as a shooter and a scorer, he's he's easily the best. Even as a freshman, because his jump shot is more fluid. As a driver, I'm still taking Ty Lawson over him any day of the week. It's just pure talent wise, he's probably the best. I mean, I would say he's the best and and I would say I mean you say a guy that, you know, when when it comes to driving the basket, I mean you 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 would take Lawson, but I dude, I mean it's it's got to be pretty close, right? There's no way that it's that much of a difference because they're I mean, they're they're both very aggressive, and both of them made some of the more difficult shots driving the basket that we've seen um, in in uh, under Roy Williams as point guards. So I don't know. I that I see. That's where I think you know maybe Lawson does have an advantage there, but the fact of the matter is, it's not that much of a difference. And so when you bring in the fact that he is. A guy that is just such a volume – I mean, he is an unbelievable volume scorer at the point guard position. He's a guy that can create his own shot. Uh, Out in open space, he's amazing. And, you know, really defensively, I think he's improved as the year's gone along. Now, the thing – this is the difference when it comes to all the other guys. We have so much more to go off of. With those guys, with Kobe White, the reason that we have to have this conversation now and that we might have to revisit it later in the year is because 
we don't know how long he's staying. There's a real chance that he could end up going to the NBA. And I saw someone put this on Twitter earlier today, and I couldn't really – there's no way I could agree more at this point with this fact that it looks like there's a chance that Kobe White's going to go early. And Nazir Little might be the guy – out of the two that you would say has a better chance of coming back. Now, I believe in most people's minds, they believe both of them are gone at this point. But if you look at the two of them right now, they might be right in saying that, yeah, out of the two of them, Kobe's probably the one that is the most likely to go pro at this point because, I mean, he's sailing up draft boards if he keeps playing the way that he's playing right now, I mean, he could definitely get inside the top five, right? I mean, you would think that it would be the three Duke players, uh, John Morant from Murray State, and then probably Kobe if he keeps playing at this rate. I mean, is is that is that kind of what you're thinking too, or? Yeah, I mean, I, I saw a mock today that had him twenty fifth. And said the reason why he's so low is he lacks explosiveness. Ah, uh, that's about that's that's like the I mean that's the main thing he brings to the table. I mean I don't really <laughs> understand that breakdown. Yeah, that, the, the thing with Kobe is you know we're seeing the player that we you know we thought we were going to get in November, which we never should have thought because that's just not how this works. He's finally comfortable playing at the college level, running the complex Carolina system. He's not thinking as much. He's just playing. And when the kid just plays, he's as gifted as anybody in the country. Um, and the thing is, is his game is only going to elevate at the next level or flourish because he has an NBA game. His, his game isn't built to be in the structure of a college offense the way we, we play. It's really not. He'll be a, a very good pro because he has a mid-range jump shot. He can get to the rim by himself. He can step back and hit a three. All those things that the modern point guard has to do in the NBA, he can do and do, and do very well. So, but right now, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to enjoy what he's doing because he's leading this team on the verge of competing to win an ACC championship. And now we've had we've 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 emerged in the national discussion as a team that's got to be mentioned as a Final Four and national championship contender. Um, and I don't think after Kentucky and Louisville losses, we thought that was going to happen. So we'll definitely re- have to revisit, like you said, whether he leaves early or whether he comes back. There'll be discussions we have about where he stands among Carolina point guards because he's definitely fit the mold as one of the next great ones. Um, with that in mind, we'll go ahead and get to tomorrow night's showdown with uh, Virginia. The Cavaliers will come into town for a monster game with, with the Tar Heels after losing at home to Duke on Saturday, 81-71. to So they got swept by, by the Blue Devils. There are only two losses on the year, by the way. Um, but they, the thing is, is those two games against Duke, Duke's had their way offensively. They scored, I think it was 70 two or 74 in the first game and they scored 81 last night uva on the whole gives up 54 a game so duke and all their supreme talent's been very effective against virginia even playing that uva tempo they have been a whole lot of running and gunning like duke wants to do they've just been really effective in the half court and a big part of that is they're not turning the ball over carolina yesterday uh, yesterday against miami only 10 turnovers they're going to need to replicate that to give themselves a chance. If they come down and turn the thing over 17 times, it's going to be hard for them to lose because we're, we're, not, we're not built to play a 55 to 60 possession game with 17 of those being turnovers. If that happens, we'll get blown out on our home floor. So as we, we, we get ourselves ready for this big game, and this is really a good chance for Carolina to maybe eliminate Virginia from the regular season as, and make it just a, two, a two-team race between us and Duke, what are you going to be having your eyes on tomorrow night? Well, I mean, first of all, you, you want to see you, – you mentioned that really Duke played at Virginia's tempo. And I think that Carolina showed a little bit, as you mentioned, against Miami 
that they have the ability to play in the half court when needed. And again, that's that pretty much at this point we've seen in past years. It's going to be reliant on whether or not you can make the outside shots because Virginia is not going to make it easy to go inside on them. That pack line defense is extremely difficult to drive the basket with, and they're not going to make those entry passes easy. So the main thing is, is look, if they're there, get the ball inside. But if not, you can't force it because, like you said, turnovers will kill you against Virginia because of just the the little amount of possessions that you have. I mean, Virginia's goal is to hold you between 50 and 60 possessions in a game, which, you know, some people are kind of questioning, well, how how much different is that from other games? Most other games, if I'm not mistaken, you average around 80 to 90. Am I correct? Can you repeat that? I uh, did not get the last part of the question. I'm in, sorry. In, no, you're good. In most games, you, you, you in I'll say in ACC play, you average about eighty to ninety possessions a game, right? As as a team. Yeah, Carolina has done a very good job getting. I mean, they shot it. They 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 normally shoot well over sixty shots a game. They normally average at least ten to fifteen turnovers, and then you're looking at normally fifteen to twenty free throws. So, yeah, about a 90, 90 at the max. Right. Um, there's a very good chance tomorrow, if, if, if they get the game into the six, excuse me, the 60s, I think, well, then, then, then I think we're doing something right. Right, uh, exactly. UVA, because Virginia is just so good at taking the, the life out of the game and still being effective. Like, everyone thinks that they want to make the game dirty or ugly. It's, we would appreciate it more if they scored more. Because the way they defend is how everybody, that's how I want my team to defend. You know? And on offense, they take really good shots. It's just they're shooting it with three seconds on the shot clock instead of 13. And for fans, that's not entertaining. But they play a really unique, and if we ever would appreciate it, a beautiful style of basketball that we just have to adjust to because. We're not gonna we're not gonna get this game up and down the floor, even if we want to. They're gonna dictate tempo, but I think it says more about us if we beat them at their own game. We beat them playing in the half court. That says a lot about who we are and what and what kind of team we can and will be. Well, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, how many teams actually dictate the tempo against Virginia? There are very few. Am I right? I mean, it's not it's not an easy thing to do. So more than likely, you're going to have to play at their pace. And Carolina, I I think, has the shooters to do that at this point. I think Kobe White has shown that. It'll help that Ty Jerome is not at 100%, and he'll be coming off a two-day turnaround. That's the other thing that helps Carolina is the fact that they are coming off a two-day turnaround just like the Tar Heels, and they're also coming off a two-day turnaround against Duke. And I think that's one of the other big factors in this game that people on the outside probably don't realize. For Carolina, this game is the one that they've been looking forward to since the Louisville game concluded. I mean, yeah, we, we said, look, don't overlook Miami. I don't know if they did. I, I don't think that that's necessarily the reason why they struggle because I think, you know, we've seen it before with Miami that they always play them tough. But for my, but excuse me, for Virginia, Virginia was not looking forward to Carolina. Carolina was in the back of their mind. They were looking at revenge against Duke. First of all, it was on home. And they knew that if they beat Duke, then pretty much there, there's a chance, I would say, that they were then back in control of their own destiny in the ACC. Because their back half of the schedule is a little bit easier than Duke's back half of the schedule. And you got to think also, senior-laden team, Duke is younger, so you would feel that maybe Duke has some slip-ups on the back half. Instead, now they get beat at home, and... Now they have to find a way after losing a game that they put a ton into 
at home. Now they got to go on the road and try to regain themselves against a team in Carolina that comes in on fire and comes in with the mindset of, hey, this is the game that we've been looking forward to. This is our chance to prove that we are a legitimate national title contender at this point, which I still think going in, and I think, honestly, barring a complete disastrous blowout, I think even you know, after the result, I still feel like this team is a national title contender, but in their mind, if they win this game, this is when people around the country, this is when the bracketologists will start saying, this is a legitimate team. This is a one line team at this moment. And I think that's where, you know, things might be a little bit different heading into this game than maybe in some of the past meetings, the last few seasons. Yeah, I always feel bad for those teams that have the the, the, the back-to-back games with, with Duke and then Carolina or Carolina and then Duke. Oh, I don't feel bad for Virginia. <laughs> well, in this case, I don't. But, like, especially like if, if, if for some reason it's a team and I think it was – like, I know Georgia Tech did. They played Duke and then they played us and now Virginia's done it. It's even worse when they got to do both games on the road. They got to go to either the Smith Center first or then to Cameron, like – Come on, schedule makers. But, yeah, I mean, Virginia's definitely – their psyche is going to be a little out of whack because Duke's been very – Duke's had their number the last couple of years, and Carolina's had their number in the Smith Center. When they go to Charlottesville, it's a completely different story. We, I'd only go to that game thinking it's a loss just because we don't play well there. Whether Before they even got really good, we struggled there. And now it's just become a nightmare place for us to go. But – I'm going to let you go ahead and pick the game because I'm still sitting here trying to waver because Carolina's won seven in a row. At some point, they're going to lose. I don't want it to be tomorrow night because, you know, these are these are the games that make ACC basketball fun, especially for a Carolina fan. I love waking up knowing we're going to play in a big-time basketball game tonight and we're going to be ready for a fight. Um so who do you got winning? I mean, I, I just told you what I think will be the difference. I think the motivation level for Carolina is going to be a little bit higher than the motivation level for Virginia. Um, you know, I think that Carolina so far is showing that they have the ability to play the half-court game that Virginia will want to play, something that in past years we really maybe haven't had. And I also think that even though Virginia is going to try to slow the, slow the heels down, I do think that Kobe White is going to pick his moments where he's going to be aggressive. And I feel like, you know, he's the type of player that right now is playing at that level that's necessary, and also is really that stubborn player that knows, look, I'm going to play my game as it, whenever I get the chance. I think Virginia turns the ball over a few times. That allows Carolina to get in the open court. I think they take advantage of that. I think that you know Carolina bounces back with a good night on the glass because we've never really seen Carolina have back-to-back bad nights on the glass. I think ultimately, again, it's going to be another great game. I think this one could end up being another classic like we saw against Miami. Um, So prepare your shorts, prepare your fingernails. It's going to be a long game. I think Carolina ends up pulling out the victory. I think it's by three to five points, a close one. Um, And I think the Tar Heels get that signature victory and get to 10 and one in conference to keep pace with Duke. And right now, If this ends up happening and Carolina ends up winning, boy, that matchup in 10 days from now against the Blue Devils is going to be something. Yeah, that's kind of why, you know, I want I want Carolina to win, and I and 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 I'm gonna go ahead and say I I I think the Heels win. I don't know if this is gonna be pretty or if it's gonna be ugly. I think they're at home. They, I think they refuse to lose again at home because, you know, they're playing for the, the man that his name's on that floor now. So when you lose a game, you, you disrespect Dean Smith, then you disrespect Roy Williams now. Um, I do think the crowd's going to have to be a major factor tomorrow. I know it's a 7 o'clock tip. they got to bring the energy from the get-go. So if you're going to the game, get there, get there early, be loud, be proud, and, 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 and really cheer these guys on. But I'm with you. It's been now six years since Carolina and Duke have played with the final match.
matchup having anything regarding ACC uh, standings. There's a very good chance that when they play in two weeks or in a week and a half and then after that in March, both of those games will decide who wins the ACC. That's what makes the rivalry what it is, the best in college athletics. Um, it's what makes this sport that much more entertaining when they're both playing with something on the line. And I think, and I think you know, that pushes both of these teams not want to lose the game because you, you're already playing in the biggest game in, in the sport, but then you have all the other the pressure on it makes it that much better. I think Carolina wins. I think Kobe White is in the groove and leads the team to another win to get to 10-1 in the ACC to continue the best start under Roy Williams in conference play and keep this team ascending towards the top of the country. So we're looking forward to it. We're going to be hanging out watching this game, so that's going to be fun and exciting. Might even try to do a halftime thing um, if we can get that up and running during tomorrow night's game. So is there anything else you want to contribute to this podcast, or uh, are we ready to wind this thing down? I think that's the way to take us out, man, because uh, I think we're both really hyped for this game against Virginia, and uh, I'm hoping, yeah, I'm hoping the students and the fan base are, are ready to go because uh, tomorrow night is a big game for both teams, and you mentioned it. In order to stay and keep pace with Duke, you got to get the win. So the Smith Center, I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be rocking. So, yeah, let's wrap it up and get out of here and uh, begin preparing ourselves uh, for what should be an amazing game. All righty. I do want to thank you for joining me tonight and the, your efforts with the uh, Miami Breakdown. I do want to encourage you guys to uh, subscribe to this podcast. You can find us through Spreaker, iTunes, Spotify, and now iHeartRadio. Also, check out the blog. There'll be uh, some stuff going up with the Miami game, Virginia game, and some uh, some Duke content coming up for next week's matchup. Also, check out the sister blog, the Heel Tough blog, as Anthony you know recaps signing day and keeps you up to date with all the things going on in Carolina football. What an exciting time it is now with Mac Brown back on campus. I want to thank you guys for listening. Go Tar Heels.